If I told you to look in your closet or dresser and estimate for me how many articles of clothing you own, how many would it be? If you're anything like me, the answer is probably too many to count. In modern day America, to have this type of relationship with clothing is not all that uncommon. We buy clothes for an occasion, for a season, only to donate them, to pass them to a friend or a relative, or just simply forget them in the back of our closets. And all of this is understandable to an extent. For one, most clothing in America is cheap, and sometimes it is even handed out. Over the course of my life, I have probably received 20 plus t-shirts that I never paid or asked for, just simply from attending school events, camps, or participating in sports. Clothing is also rarely personal anymore, or at least it's hardly ever couture. Tailors only ever really exist now to fit pre-made suits or shirts, and cobblers who make bespoke shoes are pretty much a thing of the past, and good luck finding one in any city smaller than Chicago. Taking all this into account, it is hardly surprising that the average American creates 82 pounds of textile waste a year. From this statistic, the relative lack of value in modern clothing is apparent. Of course, things weren't always this way. In fact, for the majority of clothing's existence, it was much more valuable and much less disposable. A fantastic example of the importance and value that clothing could have in a society was in ancient Rome, where clothes were not only greatly valued, but often had symbolic functions in society. Today we'll discuss Roman clothing, how it was made, as well as some common styles and their importance and symbolism in society. To begin this discussion, let's talk about the construction of the Romans' clothes. Now, to make clothes, you first need to have threads to create textiles. Roman textiles were largely produced from two materials, wool and linen. These were not the only materials that Roman clothes were made out of, but these were the primary ones because they were ones that were able to be harvested within the country. Other uh, textiles would have to be imported, or threads would have to be imported, rather. So let's talk a little bit about both wool and linen. So wool in the Roman Empire would have meant sheep's wool, and this was likely the most popular material, and it was pretty practical for the Mediterranean. It was capable of being cool in the summer, as well as being sort of warm and insulating in the winter, and it was also pretty uh, weather resistant, um, as sheep's wool has sort of a natural resistance to water. It was also a lot easier to dye than other materials. And I want you to remember this because it's gonna be, uh, play a bigger role later on in the presentation. Wool was also pretty convenient from a supply standpoint as sheep have a lot of other uses. So it made sense to keep sheep around because they could also be used for um, you know, food if you killed them or milk or, and also leather. Though the material itself had many advantages, processing wool was still a very difficult endeavor. Uh, a lot of this difficulty comes from the nature of having to harvest the wool from an animal. So the fibers would have to be removed from the sheep at first, and this could either be done with shears or through just plucking the fibers off of the sheep, which would probably be a little bit more difficult. After this, the wool would need to be washed to remove impurities and after being washed, then the wool would be pulled um, apart by hand. This was a pretty difficult and time-consuming process as the wool would have been pretty matted, um, just you know, from the animal being outside and roaming around. It's not like sheep or you know, brush their hair or anything, so it's all matted down. And even after washing, uh, a lot of the times it can still contain contaminants or burrs that are left over in that wool that would need to be pulled out by hand. But after you had the wool a little bit more refined, it was able to be carded. And carding is a process essentially uh, where somebody would take a comb or a brush to separate the individual fibers of the wool. And then from this point, you could go forward and make thread. But before we talk about the thread making process, I'm gonna talk about the other type of fiber that the Romans commonly derived, and that was linen. Um, linen was derived from the flax plant, you know, uh, something very similar to what modern day wheat was at least in appearance. And one of the major benefits of using linen was that it was lighter and it was more breathable than wool. It was also easier to wash than wool was. Uh, as I talked about, wool has certain hydrophobic properties 
In return, however, though, uh, linen was not quite as robust and durable as wool. It was also more difficult to color with dyes. Uh, much like processing wool, processing linen from flax was pretty difficult, and it was a time-consuming process. Our modern understanding of how flax was processed in ancient times seems to be largely based upon the accounts of Pliny the Elder, as this was really the only source I could find for how linen was processed in the Roman Empire. So I'm going to, rather than try to paraphrase this and probably ultimately end up plagiarizing it, I'm just going to share with you a section um, from Pliny the Elder's book, Natural History, where he talks about um, this process. So Pliny says that the maturity of flax can be recognized by a couple indications. The swelling and the seed, uh, of the swelling of the seed and the appearance of a yellowish color. It can then be pulled up and bound to a hand-sized little bundles and then they set out to hang and dry while the roots turned upwards for a few days. Then in five more days with the heads of the bundles turned in toward each other. So you can see this is already taking a long time because the, there's already 10 days here where the uh, flax has to dry out. So after the uh, wheat is harvested, the actual stalks of the flax are soaked in water that is warmed by the sun, although they have to be sunk under a weight because they're so light and they would float to the top. The loosening outer coat is an indication that they are soaked, and again, they are turned upside down and dried in the sun, and then once they're dried up, they're pounded under a stone with something called a toe hammer, uh, and the part nearest to the skin is called the oakum, an interior linen that is more fit for lamp wicks, and it is combed, however, with iron claws until the entire outer skin is peeled off, and then the outer skin can be used to heat ovens and furnaces. For the pith, there's a variety of grades according to whiteness and softness, and the pith is what would be used, you know, for the actual uh, clothing. Of course, with both of these materials, I've only covered the process for creating the fibers, in order to make a textile, the fibers would first have to be made into a sort of yarn, and then they could be woven together from that point. So the process for making the yarn would be done with a couple of tools used in tandem. This would be a distaff and a spindle, which I have pictured here. So the distaff would be what held all the fibers together, and then the ends of the fibers would come from the distaff and be attached to what is called a spindle, which is this sort of long needle-shaped object. The spindle would often incorporate a horl, which was used at the bottom of the spindle to add weight. This basically just made the spindle easier to uh, spin around. And the twisting of the spindle would bunch the fibers from the distaff and form a thread. And the thickness and the coarseness of this thread could be varied by the spinning technique. So once the fibers were made with the distaff and the spindle, they could finally be formed into an actual textile using a loom. Now, there are different historical accounts on which type of loom the Romans actually used, uh, but most people think that the Romans used a vertical loom rather than a horizontal loom, which I will show here. So this type of loom is also called a warp-weighted loom. So in the picture, you can see that the threads that were created by the distaff and the spindle now hang from the top of the loom, and they are held in place in the bottom by weights. So as the name of the loom suggests, the weighted threads are referred to as warp. Once the threads are in place, the weaver can then go back and forth, starting at the top, using some, a tool called a shuttle that would bring another thread through on the horizontal axis. This would be called the uh, weft thread. And warp and weft threads are sort of interesting because they're still present in a lot of modern day clothing. If you are familiar with a pair of blue jeans, and I'm almost certain that you are, you might even be wearing a pair right now, you can uh, visibly see the warp and weft threads in the jeans, the warp threads being the ones that go um, down vertically and are more white in color, and then the blue threads that go horizontally would be the weft threads. But that segue aside, once this process was done and uh, the fabric was made on the loom, you would then have what was essentially a completed textile. It is worth noting that this process in the Roman Empire was done pretty much entirely by women. This was a continuation of the trend that was set by earlier people in the Mediterranean, most notably the Greeks. And a lot of the time, this long and laborious process um, was actually done inside of Roman homes. This also meant that clothing was a little bit more personal, because in addition to the amount of time that would have to be spent manufacturing a garment, 
That garment was also probably made by someone you know, you know, a family member or your wife, or maybe you made it for yourself. So this explains why clothing was much more cherished in the Roman Empire in part, because it's obviously much more personal. You're not going to trash and just disregard something that you personally spent or your wife spent hours and upon hours manufacturing. So with the inherent value that was vested in clothing in the Roman Empire, it may not come as a surprise that certain articles of clothing developed uh, farther as status symbols. To understand the status that was given to Roman clothing, we must first discuss uh, some common types of Roman clothing. Now, if I were hosting an episode of Family Feud and the prompt were, we asked 100 people what they thought the most commonly worn article of clothing in the Roman Empire was, it would probably be wise for you to respond, the toga. However, despite what is predicted in modern movies and television, as well as, you know, the Romans' own art and paintings and portraits, the toga was likely not the most common article of clothing um, for Romans. And it's not what every Roman wore every day. The article that actually served this purpose of daily wear for most Romans was the tunica, which is name you can tell is very similar to tunic and the garment is very similar to a tunic. It was created out of two pieces of wool or linen that could be sewn together at the seams and the top. And it sort of, you know, would look like a large pillowcase or sack, but it would have openings for the head and the arms, obviously. The tunica could be worn with or without a belt at the waist, and this garment, in my opinion, is sort of like the Roman version of a t-shirt because it could be worn alone, it could be worn in multiples. It could be worn with an outer garment, such as a toga. And how a tunica was worn and what it looked like was actually largely relying on class. So some ro lower class Romans would have worn an undyed white tunica as their daily wear without uh, a toga or any sort of covering over top of it. Something else that's uh, really notable about a tunica is that sometimes you can see this even depicted in um, Roman art is that the tunica would um, essentially have one of the arms or the wearer would have one of their arms taken out of the armhole and then the other armhole would be pulled over the head uh, to sort of make you know more of a kind of uh, open garment that, that's sort of more off the body this could be used for uh, laboring especially for you know the lower class Romans who were you know spent a lot more time laboring a tunic that was worn without any sort of uh, covering over it was known as a tunicati, and that was, again, reserved for just lower class members of Roman society. Those in higher classes would often wear tunicas that incorporated dyed stripes, which were uh, referred to as clavi. For men, these stripes were indicative of certain occupations and roles in Roman society. A tunica with purple stripes was known as a tunica Angusti Clavi, and this was worn by judges and higher-ranking military men. This tunica, along with other dyed tunicas, would be worn with a toga over top of it, although the toga would be draped in a way in which the right side of the tunica would be visible, visible underneath to ensure that you know the, the stripes, the clavi, could be seen. The color purple was used for the stripes on this type of tunica um, because it was one of the most prominent and recognizable uh, symbols of status in the Roman Empire. Part of this status of the color stems from the difficult process of obtaining purple dye. The c color of the purple dye in Rome was more specifically referred to as Tyrrhenian purple, and to obtain it, one would need to capture Mediterranean sea snails. So these sea snails have a natural defense mechanism that allows them to produce a secretion and the secretion uh, was used to make the purple dye. So it could be extracted from the snail either by crushing it and killing it, or you could try to keep the snail alive and then just sort of uh, probe it, you know, by activating its defense mechanisms and then collecting the secretions, which was obviously, if you could squeeze it, a better way to do it because you keep the snails alive and you get a longer supply of the dye. Another type of dyed tunica was the tunica laticlavia, and the Lata Clavia featured dyed purple stripes that were presented in a very similar fashion to the uh, Angusti Clavi, but they were considerably wider. And this was worn, or these tunicas rather, were worn by the Roman senatorial class. 
and it would be worn under a toga in the similar fashion to the Angus di Clavi. And as you can see from these two tunicas, the increasing use of the purple dye seems to indicate a higher status. And this is um, also furthered by the next tunica, which I want to talk about, which is a very special tunica to the Romans, and that's why I wanted to include it. And it's called the Tunica Palmata. So the Tunica Palmata was pretty much just a symbol of victory, and it was used or worn by a successful military general or higher up. And this was a much more ostentatious tunica than the ones that were previously discussed, in the sense that it is really intentionally trying to be flashy. It would have been constructed of silk rather than linen, which uh, had to be imported again, and was thus more scarce, and it was dyed pretty much entirely purple, is what some accounts say. And the palmata was also adorned with gold thread and gold embroidery, um, which some people believe the embroidery would have looked like leaves. It was worn with a toga that was designed to accompany it as well. So this whole ensemble is just, you know, a big show. It's a big statement piece to make when someone would return successfully from a battle. And of course, it features prominent use of the color purple, as we've discussed. It's a huge status symbol in Rome. So there were other types of tunicas that had specific purposes in the Roman Empire, such as the tunica recta that was worn when a boy made his ceremonial transition into manhood. But for the sake of time, I'm going to continue onward to start talking about the types of dress for female Romans. So women in Rome also wore tunicas, but they would be typically fashioned to extend farther down on the legs, which made them look a little bit more like an ankle length dress. And their construction was essentially the same as male tunicas, though, you know, sewn up at the sides and the top, and then left holes for arms and head. And women's tunicas did not have all of the same variants as their male counterparts, and likely due to the fact that women had little involvement in the Roman government and military. However, this is not to say that women's clothing did not have its own variances with its own symbolic distinctions. One of the most common variances for women's clothing was the stola, which is a sort of uh, like a dress. The stola was not particularly tailored, uh, and what I mean by that is it lacks a structure or design of a modern dress. It's really more akin to just a long tube of fabric that was then held up uh, by shoulder straps, which were called instate. And the primary purpose of the stola was to symbolize that a woman was married. And it also served a little bit of a practical function in that sense, as it was intent, partially intended to make a married woman appear more modest in public, as she would literally just have another layer of fabric worn on top of her tunica. Stolas could also be colored or dyed. Um, unlike the dyed stripes, though, on men's tunicas, these colors were not necessarily uh, designated to specific professions as much as they just deno uh, denoted general wealth and status. Again, purple was used here only for the highest class of Roman uh, woman. Another commonly worn woman's item was the pala, and this is what we would likely refer to as today as a shawl or a cloak. And this was a large piece of fabric, I'm talking like meters long, that would uh, serve as another layer to a woman's ensemble. It would really only be worn outside, however, and in the imperial period of Rome, it was actually essential for married women to wear one of these in public. The pala would be uh, fastened together by brooches, and these brooches could be another way for a woman to show her wealth or status because they could be made of many different things, you know, precious metal or stones or uh, bone, pretty much a lot, lots of different things. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Where in the world is the toga? So, for the purposes of this presentation, I've chosen to discuss the most ubiquitous Roman garment last, as I feel that it really drives home the point that I'm trying to make about the symbolic importance of Roman clothing. But let's talk about it. So, as I've previously discussed, the toga was not actually worn every day by all Romans. And I also said previously that a tunica was kind of like a Roman t-shirt. 
Well, if a tunica is like a Roman t-shirt, then a toga is more like a modern two-piece uh, suit or even a tuxedo. And this is to say that it was worn on formal occasions and it was generally considered a symbol of wealth and status to have a nice toga, much like having a nice modern suit. Also much like suits for the majority of their history, a toga was only ever worn by Roman boys or men. In addition to being a man, there was another prerequisite for wearing a Roman toga. And that was that to wear a toga, one had to be a natural-born Roman citizen. And this last requirement is likely one of the main reasons that we consider the toga to be so quintessentially Roman today. The toga is actually one of the only garments that was worn by Romans that was really of their original design. Most other garments like the tunica or the stola were really heavily derivative of Greek designs. So you probably have a decent idea of what a toga looked like, but what was it specifically? Well, it was a piece of wool fabric that was fashioned in a shape that looked somewhat similar to a half circle. It was about five meters long and two and a half meters wide for an adult toga, that is. And a lot of fabric went into making one. So the toga would be wrapped around the body in a specific pattern, and it was almost necessary to have somebody else wrap the toga around. It was really difficult to try to do it yourself. And for upper class Romans, this would mean uh, use of a slave. So upper classmen are, you know, would have someone that just basically did their tunic for them every morning that they needed to wear it. So much like the tunica, the toga came in many different styles and colors. And the essential toga was the toga virilis. And this was an all white toga. And it's the style that's most imitated today. So this is probably what you think of when you think of a toga. And the toga virilis literally means the toga of manhood. And as the name suggests, this was the toga that was worn by male citizens of Rome of multiple classes, actually. Uh, upper and lower class would likely have one of these in their wardrobe. And this toga replaced the toga protexta that was worn by Roman boys. And though the toga protexta was worn by Roman boys, it was also worn by uh, higher magistrates in the Roman courts. And uh, what the protexta looked like is similar to some of the tunicas I talked about. It incorporated a purple stripe, but this time the purple stripe would go around the uh, edge of the toga so that when it was uh, wrapped around, it was presented in a, you know, a nice fashion. There were also dark colored togas that were known as toga pulla, and these were used specifically for funerals and for mourning. And I thought that this one was particularly notable and should be included because this is one symbol in the Roman Empire that actually does seem to have a parallel in contemporary society as people still commonly wear black to funerals and for mourning. A black suit or a black dress is pretty much the typical funeral attire today. The last type of toga that I want to talk about here is the toga purpurea, and this is the toga that would have accompanied the tunica palmata, and it completed the ensemble of a victorious uh, Roman military man or general, and much like the palmata, the entire purpurea was dyed a deep purple. This also was a notable toga later on in the uh, Roman Empire as emperors actually started to wear this one. So not just people in the military, it had a little bit of a dual use. So now that we've talked about some of the different types of togas, this brings me toward the end of the presentation. And what I really wanted to drive home with this presentation is that people in the Roman Empire had a much different relationship with clothing than we do today. And this is for multiple reasons. For one, clothing, as we discussed, was so much more difficult to make. The process for even making a textile that could then be fashioned into a garment took, you know, weeks or even months in s sometimes. And also the process was done by people who a lot of the time were in the home of the person that would end up wearing the garment. So clothing was a lot more personal and people had that personal connection with it and cherished it more because of that. I also believe that another reason that there was such an emphasis put on the importance of clothing in the Roman Empire was that it was a really good way to show status, at least for them. You know, modern times we have social media and we have other things like expensive cars or homes or watches that can be shared with people on you know Facebook or Instagram and that would be a really great way of showing someone that you made it you know or that you're wealthy or this is the type of lifestyle you live the Romans didn't have any of this the only time to really show off who they were was when they went out in public and one way to do that without verbal communication would have been 
to wear an elaborate outfit or at least an outfit that is more elaborate than what a common person might be wearing. So I think this uh, really helped catapult clothing into the forefront of Roman status symbols. So when you take these factors into account, it actually is pretty logical why Romans had such a different relationship with clothing that we do today. And it's interesting to really look back at that and see that something that we pretty much take for granted today a lot of the times was you know such a big deal and such a uh, the most basic type of clothing could even be considered a huge indicator of status.